I'm Dr. Orion Taraban, and this is PsychHacks, Better Living Through Psychology. And the topic of today's short talk is why successful men cheat. This is a fascinating question because it does seem to be a rampant phenomenon among successful men, doesn't it? We see this behavior in presidents, in movie stars, in world-class athletes, in billionaires. It just doesn't seem like a coincidence that all these men who come from all different walks of life and who attain success in so many independent domains of achievement would just happen to manifest the same behavior, especially given how socially unacceptable the behavior is. I also don't think we can just call them narcissists. I'm sure some of them are. However, in this case, it would kind of be affirming the consequent. So maybe there's something else in play here. And before I get into what that might be, please remember to like this video and subscribe to this channel. It takes less than a second, costs you nothing, and it's an easy way to get a hit of dopamine. So do the thing. On the surface. On the surface, the cheating behavior of successful men is entirely irrational. Why is that? Because in such cases, the risk-reward profile is insanely high. A man might lose his fortune, his career, his reputation, his family, and his social opportunities for a sexual escapade. I mean, that's about a, as big a risk as a man can take for potentially not a great deal of pleasure. So it doesn't make rational sense that successful men would risk it all just to have an adventure. And these guys didn't arrive at the apex of their respected domains by being irrational. My general rule of thumb is that most people are mostly rational. So if a behavior looks irrational from the outside, that's usually due to the interpretive frame through which we're viewing it. Assuming a person is actually behaving rationally can allow us to learn a lot about how the behavior potentially makes sense. And the same is true here. Cheating in successful men becomes rational if we flip our understanding. It's not that these men threw away their success for the sake of an affair. It's that these men spent their lives becoming successful in order to have the affair to begin with. We can argue that the whole point of their success, of being the best in the world, in business, in politics, in athletics, conscious or not, was to secure easier access to more and more desirable women. That's why they work so hard. Whether they were aware of it or not, a man would invent an eighth day of the week if it meant he could get easier access to more and more desirable women. Now, sometimes this is conscious, like in the movie Scarface. First you get the money, then you get the power, then you get the women. We think it's gauche to say it out loud, but we all kind of know that it's true. At the very least, we can all agree that it's never the other way around, like first you get the women, and then you get the power, and then you get the money. That statement makes no sense, right? However, in most cases, this objective is unconscious. Couple this with the fact that men don't really even begin to have good optionality until they're in their 30s and 40s, by which point most of them have already gotten married, and you have a recipe for infidelity. The desire coupled with the optionality just makes for a temptation larger than many men can bear. It's like the ring of power. Even the wholesome little Frodo gets corrupted in the end. What you need to consider is that these powerful, successful men have actually deferred their gratification for quite some time, sometimes decades, in the service of their ambitions and excellence, which is itself in the service of better access to potential mates. Socially expecting a person to then forego the sought after reward when it's finally offered after years of deferment is probably unreasonable. Should these men never have gotten married in the first place? Potentially, but people are complicated and the reality is that sexual exclusivity is just one aspect of most marriages and it's generally not 
the primary reason. That is, people don't get married to be sexually exclusive. You can do that without getting married. They typically get married to have children and start a family in a protected way. Throwing the baby out with the bathwater isn't always the best idea. And of course, if we think this might be true, we should probably not be pressuring men to get married, which absolutely continues to happen. Leo DiCaprio gets a lot of flack for staying single and dating beautiful women in his late 40s. However, if he had gotten married, he would have gotten even more flack if he cheated on his wife or divorced her for a younger woman. The end goal of male ambition and drive is to secure better and wider access to women. It is what it is. And this, of course, is really only possible because the outcomes of male ambition and drive, namely success and status, happen to be the general preferences of women. So it's a two-way street. This is basically an evolutionary argument which suggests that these roots are very deep. And that's why the higher up the social hierarchy you go, the more you will see this kind of behavior no matter what hierarchy you look at. On some level, it's the point the hierarchies exist in the first place. And if we can leave aside any moral judgments we might have, we should therefore expect to see this behavior in successful and powerful men in all walks of life and every domain of excellence, which is, of course, what we do, in fact, see. So let's not be so shocked when it happens. What do you think? Keep it respectful and let me know in the comments below. Thanks for listening.